hey, we want to wrap up the seven days of prayer and fasting and waiting on God. And the reason why we set out to do this is because we've been teaching on higher dimension living. Look at somebody and say, higher dimension living. <laughs> and that when you go higher in life, you encounter higher devils. Higher dimension living comes with what? Higher devils. Higher levels, higher devils. So, two things happen in life to get you there. You either fight your way there to that higher dimension, and you fight your stay in that place. You fight your way This is this high, you are here on this ground level, and you're going up. You fight your way to get up there. And when you get up there, you fight, you fight your stay. Good things don't come easily, particularly if they are valuable things. You fight your way to the top, and you fight your stay at the top. And that is the Christian story. So you ask yourself every now and again, when do I stop fighting? You will only stop fighting when two things happen, when you die or when the devil is eliminated from this world. That's the two times you will stop fighting. When you die or when the devil is eliminated from this world. The Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The Bible says that even though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. You must, you're constantly fighting. That, that's why it's important for you to be on guard. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says that you must be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, is walking around like what? A roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. A study was carried out with some fishes where they put a fish, I don't remember the particular species now, but they put this fish in a, a tank with other predatory fishes. And they realized that this fish had to fight for its survival. So it was, it was active, it was moving around all along. Why? Because they, they were, he was surrounded by predators. You are surrounded by devils. You are surrounded by demons. You are surrounded by spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. You are surrounded by the rulers of the present world of darkness. So you must be, you must have this uh, fighter's mentality where you are always on guard. Because if you are not on your guard, the devil will have you for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner. The Bible says that he's going around like a roaring lion, like a roaring lion, Pastor John was saying earlier this morning, that he is not the lion, but he mimics the lion. Because Jesus is the only lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. And the devil is a very good copycat. So you fight your way up, and you fight your way there. So, I told you that there are three dimensions. We fight at three levels. Do you remember? Three levels. Who remembers that? Who remembers that? We have, we have the devil. Oh, we have, right? Are you with me? Please stay with me. We have the devil on one side. Let me do this. We have devil here. And then we have you. Let me, let's put you with blue. Blue stands for love. Okay, let's use self like we in the, in the previous study. This is self or you. Please stay with me, guys. Stop, stop those things. Fool me. Please be looking at those guys. I don't want them to be on the phone when, they are, when I'm teaching. I don't, I don't like it. People say I'm picking on the choir because you guys are distracting me. So, um, no, 
let's, let's do this. Let's do this, the world. The world is danger. There's something they call this in, um, in, in communication science. They call it the logic model. And then this is you. This is the devil. You are blue, right? Self. So, the devil is acting... Oh, why did I put danger here? Worlds. The devil is walking on the walls. Are you with me? Are you following me? The devil is walking on the world. And he's walking on you. Self. And guess what? The world is also walking on you. So, your warfare is at these three levels. You're fighting... I could have created another dimension here, which is actually the you, your body, soul, and your spirit. Because every mind is three-dimensional. I don't want to confuse you by creating that other dimension. This is the devil. This is the world. This is yourself. Your flesh is fighting against you. The world is fighting against you. The devil is fighting against you. How do I know the world is fighting against you? Have you not noticed that almost every commercial nowadays, even if they're advertising milk or baby powder, or baby food. There's a woman in the background on TV. You've not, have you not noticed? Am I the only one? You know you're lying. There's a woman in the background. They're advertising, going back to school bags. You see a woman walking in the background so that they can capture your attention. That is the world. Because if they just advertise the bag alone, you may not look at it. But when they put a woman in the background, you're likely to look at it. That is the world. It plays on your mind. It works on your, your mentality. And then the devil is working on the world and the devil is working on you. Three dimensions of warfare. So the Bible says, those are the three dimensions at which we are fighting. And Follow me, 2 Corinthians, I know we've read it, we'll read it. I want you to know that passage until you can, you, can, you can memorize it in your sleep or you can recite it in your sleep. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, verse 3 and verse 4. For though we walk in the flesh, what happens? We do not walk in the flesh. We are walking in the flesh. We are eating, we are talking, we are drinking, we are interacting in the flesh, but we are not walking in the flesh. It says, verse, verse 4, it says, but the weapons of our warfare, the word carnal there means they are not natural. Because we are not fighting in the flesh, we are not fighting in the natural, therefore we cannot use natural weapons to fight this warfare. We cannot. We cannot. I remember when I was in, in, in med school, uh, one of the lecturers, he was um, an eye, uh, a dentist, yeah, you know, a, um, maxillofacial surgeon. He, he was telling us a story, Christian, he was telling us a story how he was in the operating room operating on a patient. And while, and while he was operating in this room on a the patient, they were operating on another patient in the next room. And that while they were operating on this patient, this patient developed some unusual complications that are not common in circumstances like that. Being a Christian, he started praying and he rebuked the spirit of death. And guess what? This other patient, whose case was a minor surgical procedure, this patient died. So what do you think happened to the spirit of death when he left this patient? He moved over to this patient. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, against principalities. And I want you to know that these demons are not only in the developing world or the underdeveloped world or in Africa. Well, we have city demons. Oh, they, they, are, in the, they are in the city demons. <laughs> Amen. So now the Bible says, it says we should put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6. Let's go there. Ephesians chapter 6. We'll start from verse 10. We'll be anointing everybody this morning, so I'd like you to be mindful of the fact that everybody will be anointed with all. Verse 10, it says, finally, my brethren, be what? 
Let's read it together. One to go. Oh, come on. Let's read it with some force. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Because he has all power. The enemy cannot bring you down if God does not allow him to trip you. So, verse 12, it says, oh, verse 11, it says, do what? Put on what? Put on how many parts of the armor? The whole armor of God. That you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil, the cunning craftiness, the deception of the devil. I want you to put on. Don't think that one part of that armory will protect you against the deception of the devil. Now, on Wednesdays, I've been doing a teaching on weapons of our warfare. And in studying scriptures, I realized that there are weapons all the way from Genesis through Revelation. There are weapons that Abraham used, the weapons that Moses used, the weapons that Joshua used, the weapons that David used. All through scripture, Jehoshaphat used other weapons all through scriptures. In this passage, Paul tells us about what I call the Pauline weapons. We'll be talking about that later on. What I call the Pauline weapons, he tells us about the weapons that was uh, symbolic of what was going on in the Roman Empire. What, does, what are those weapons? It says, it says, put on what? The whole armor of God. And take, be guided, get your ways with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Today, can we have it? Can we have, um, let's see a picture, an image of that weapon. Can you see it? Let's have the weapon, please. That was the weapon Paul was talking about. And where he, he, he got the imagery from the typical Roman soldier. So he describes, he said, take on the loin of truth. You see that there? Are you with me? Yes. The loin of truth. The breastplate of righteousness. The helmet of salvation. The shield of faith. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I just recited that passage for you. And then he says, have on the sword of the Spirit. All of these weapons, they cover your face. There's nothing that covers your back. The sword is the only offensive weapon in all of this. All of that weapon is defensive. The, the shield of faith. He said, the shield of faith that you may quench all the fairy dust of the devil. I don't want to talk about that today. But these are the weapons of a Christian. And this, like I said, was Paul's own presentation of the weapon so that the regular Christian in the Roman Empire then could understand what he meant by the weapons of our warfare. He said, put that on. Let me just talk very quickly about the, breast, the, the, uh, the loin of uh, truth. He said, get your waist with the loin of truth. Now, in that Roman soldier, in his armor there, the thing that held everything, the, the, the breastplate, the, 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 the shoes, and everything, and the whole of that girdle was that girdle of truth. There was the belt of truth. That belt held up the whole cloth. So, sometimes some people who were being mischievous in trying to uh, embarrass the Roman soldier, they will pull away the belt. When you pull away the belt, guess what will happen? Everything will fall apart. So the Roman soldier goes around naked. Now what is truth? The Bible says that the word of God is, is truth. When you have the word of God, the word of God supports everything in your body. And that's why I've been, I've been encouraging some of you, come for Wednesday teachings, or study your Bible on a personal capacity, in a personal capacity. Because many of you have been Christians for a while, you have never studied or finished the Bible. But you know more about the Mullah probe than you know about the Bible. You know more about J-Lo and uh, who else? And Beyonce than the Bible. You know more about the Kardashians than the Bible. I hear somebody say, who is Kadasha? It's a native doctor in Oshobo. <laughs> Amen. So those are, those are the weapons. 
He said, put on this so that you can resist the enemy. Another of the weapons I found that in scriptures is the weapon of faith. Weapon of faith. Breastplate of righteousness, shield of faith. He said, with that, you can quench all the fairy dust of, of the devil. The fairy dust of the devil. Follow me to 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Let's read it together. It's on the screen. One to go. Your faith. Your faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And your faith is manifested in the expression of your mouth. The words that you speak. The pronouncements you make. And the life you live. Your faith. We act, the Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. You live your life by faith. When you give an offering, for instance, you should give it in faith, not in complaining and grumbling and reluctantly. Say, well, this offering, the church has come again. They want to collect my money. No. You are giving that money to who? To God in faith. When you serve as an usher, you are serving in faith that you are helping, as you help people to find their seat, in church, they will also find their seat in heaven, and you too will not miss your seat in heaven. When you do maintenance and you are mopping the floor, you are doing it in faith that as you mop the floor on earth, God will also mop the floor of your life. You do it in faith. You don't do it casually, cavalier, reluctantly, well, grumbling because they compelled you to do it. No. When you park cars, you park cars in faith. I was telling the ushers this morning, I said, I used to park cars and I still enjoy parking cars. Because when I park cars, I saw God in parking cars. Seriously. Because what used to happen is that service started at a thing at uh, 9 o'clock. People may not show up until about quarter to 9. And then you see a flooring of cars. And I realized that in parking those cars, sometimes when two car parkers, if I may call them that, we we'll call them holy police, when they get distracted and they want to start conversing and talking about yesterday's event, cars may crash and have an accident. What did I learn from there? I said, he that watches over Israel never slumbers nor sleep. He's never distracted. I saw God there. I remember one day I was trying to help a lady pack a Dewu razor. Some of you had no idea what a Dewu razor was. You know? Huh? Good. And the, the gear of a Dewu razor, the reverse gear, you have to raise it up. And then you bring it back. And I did not know. Right in front of a gully. So, instead of raising it up, I just moved it and brought it back. Press the accelerator. Guess what? It did not crash. God delivered me. From that, I saw the hand of God. How God never makes a mistake because he knows about the Dewu Racer even before it was manufactured. I saw God in all of this. So you act in faith. You work in faith. You labor in faith. That's why I'm challenging this church. Those of you who are still, all you do is consume all the oxygen in this sanctuary. You don't do anything else. Or you're watching online. All you do is, you breathe in the oxygen, deplete the oxygen supply in this place, but you're not, you don't do anything else. I'm challenging you to get to work and do something for God. So, you act in faith. You walk in faith. You operate in faith. So, faith is one of those weapons. Faith is that weapon that you can look at the enemy and tell him to back off in the name of Jesus and you say it with confidence in your heart. Jesus said that when you speak to this mountain and say be moved and be cast into the sea and you do not doubt in your heart. Even when you doubt in your heart, the Bible said that if your faith is like that of a, a grain of mustard seeds, it said God can use it to work wonders. It's not so much the size of your faith but the size of of the God in whom you have placed your faith. Amen. Amen. That's a weapon. Another of those weapons I see in that Ephesians chapter 6 is a weapon. Before we get to Ephesians chapter 6, it's a weapon of unity. 
Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9. The weapon of unity. And the devil knows how to use unity effectively. United we. Divided we. God said, Genesis chapter 11. He said, you see those people? They are united. That thing that they have decided to do, nothing will stop them. I mean, imagine that's God saying it. He said, that thing they've decided to do, nothing will stop them. Why? Because they are united. A church that is united. When we call for prayers, people show up to pray corporately. When we ask for fasting, people make an effort to fast corporately. Because one will chase a thousand, and two will chase ten thousand, and three will chase a hundred thousand, and four will chase a million. Geometric progression. The power of unity. So, the power of disunity is as strong as the power of unity. So, Ecclesiastes 4.12, 4, 4, no, no, 4, Ecclesiastes 4.9. What does it say? 4.9. It says two are better than one. Because their efforts, their energies are reinforced. The synergy of that produces a much greater impact than the effort of one person. That's why all these single men who are saying, I don't want to get married until I'm settled. No, marriage will settle you fast. A woman has an anointing to settle a single man. You know, because once you are together, two people, two people, your resources are maximized, your prayer is reinforced, you know, your resources are not wasted. You know, you are renting a house in uh, Guadalupe and she's renting a house in Bronx, New York. No. You're together. Two are better than one. Unitedness in prayer. Unitedness in effort. Unitedness in ambition. Unitedness in direction. So that's why the Bible said that. It says, it says, try very hard to maintain the spirit of unity in the bond of peace. Oh, the devil too will work extra hard to ensure that you are not united. It happens in couples. The Bible says that when you're not united, your prayers are just wasted. You're groaning and praying, just don't waste your time. It's wasted. So unity is a powerful force. Another one of those powerful forces is prayer and fasting. Powerful weapon is prayer and fasting. Prayer. Let's see Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Ephesians 6, 18. It says, can we read it together? I want to go. It says, praying always. With how many kinds of prayer? Open your mouth and say it with me. How many kinds of prayer? All prayers. And prayer does not stop at prayer. It said there's something called supplication, which is another word for intercession. Supplication. You pray all manner of prayer. Prayer of praise, prayer of thanksgiving, prayer of confession, prayer of repentance, prayer of, 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 prayer of faith, prayer of warfare, all manner of prayers. Prayer of prophecy, prophetic prayers, prophetic declaration prayers, Prayer of decrease, prayer of binding and losing, all manner of prayers. And then he says supplication. Supplication where you are interceding. Where you are, you are making a case before God. Where you are making an argument before God. And listen to me, my friends. That is not the prayer where you say, Father, you are on your way to, you are on your way to work. Ah, where, where are my keys? Where are my car keys? Ah, eh, um, mm, Father, I plead the blood as I'm going to walk today. No policeman on the road. Please. That, that, that's, not, that's not that kind of prayer. Supplication requires time. Requires energy. Requires effort. Requires concentration. You are entering the throne room of God. You are, you are entering the judgment seat of God to make a case. 
The Bible said, I bring your strong case before me. Present your argument. That's supplication. You are, you are having a conversation with God. God, you know that I've been, I've been talking to this girl for a while now. She keeps saying no. And, you know, and my parents are coming into town. I, I don't want her, I want her to say yes before they come. Please, Lord, I, I'm asking you, show me mercy. You are supplicating. Are you listening to what I'm saying? You are telling God exactly like it is. You know, some of you, I can hear someone say, mm, mm. listen, just tell God what it is because the Bible says that the God with whom we have to deal knows everything in our hearts. So why do you come into his presence and you are pretending that, hey, no, I don't want God to. No, tell God. I remember one day when I was a teenager growing up, the first time I, I, I got into that zone, I was fasting and I was so hungry and so tired. I just staggered into my room and said, God, you know, I'm so, I'm so hungry right now and I feel like eating. Please, Lord, help me, help me, help me. I was working in a practice where they brought a lady, a nurse, who showed up in the hospital that, that day for employment. My boss said, called me, hey, Dr. Takon, come on, come and see this. This is our new nurse. When I saw the nurse, all, everything in me, man, you understand what I'm saying, everything in me went wild. She was dressed in an Indian dress. She buys spectacle. Everything in me went wild. Ah. <laughs> and I knew she was coming to work in my hospital. What a combination. A single man and a single pretty nurse. That night, I was on call that night. I was on call. I locked myself up in the room. And I said, God, you know what happened when I saw that girl. And you know that she's going to be working in this office. And you know how I feel right now. I said, God, you know how I feel right now. Please, Lord, deliver me. De deliver me. Please, Lord, deliver me. If you don't deliver me, you will not like the story that will be told. Please, Lord, deliver me. Supplication. You are telling God exactly like it is. When she showed up the following morning, I tell you this, I'm telling you the truth. When she showed up the following morning, she was like my blood sister. All that, that vibration had disappeared. <laughs> disappeared. Until she left the practice, she was like family to me. So that's supplication. That's a weapon that you can throw at the devil. And you know, there are so, so many types of prayers where when you are praying and you begin to pray in tongues, tongues that you have not even learned and you have no clue what it is. The devil does not understand. The Bible said that when I speak with the tongues of men and the tongues of angels, prayer. Another one is fasting. 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 I know some of you, you are very Americanized. You don't, you don't fast because, like I was telling you last Sunday, was it last Sunday or two Sundays ago? You know, when you want to fast, that is when every restaurant that lives, that is, you will now, you will now recognize it. You will now notice it. You never loved eating sushi. But now, when you are driving by a sushi restaurant, you feel like going to, it's calling you, come, come and eat, come and eat. Come and eat raw, 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 raw frog. Come. <laughs> fasting. Because it's a weapon. And funny, fasting is a weapon that is used by the devil and is used by God. Because fasting takes you to a different spiritual realm. Let's see um, Matthew chapter 19, 17 verse 21. Matthew 17 verse 21. Jesus Christ had gone up the mountain, what we call the mountain of transfiguration, where he, he saw Moses, uh, Elijah, and they showed up. And as he came back down, the Bible said that there was a man who had brought his son for deliverance, who had a demon. And they couldn't pray, the disciples could not cast out the demon. Couldn't cast out the demon. 
So when Jesus Christ came, the Bible said that he cast out the dumb and the deaf spirit. Let's go, let's go back. Let's go back first to verse 19. Let's scroll back to verse 19 and see what it says. Hallelujah. Are you getting something this morning? You better do. Even if you don't, just say you are. But verse 20. They asked him, Master, why was it that we couldn't cast him out? Verse 20, Jesus said, because of your unbelief. Remember, I said faith is powerful, isn't it? For surely I said to you, if you have what? If you have what? Open your mouth and say, if you have what? Faith. Faith as a grain of mustard seed. He said, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. Brethren, I know some of you are saying that, oh, my faith is not big enough. It's okay. God gives to every man according to a measure of faith. When you are in that zone where you think your faith is not big enough, guess what? Cry out to God, Lord, help my unbelief. So Jesus said, I'll say to this mountain, you can say to it be moved and be cast into the sea and nothing will be impossible to you. Now verse 21, can we read verse 21 together? I want to go. However, by prayer and fasting, there are some conditions that will not move until you add fasting to it. Listen to me, they will not move. And I want us, as we go forward, I want us to be a church that stays on the top of the mountain. And that means we'll apply the necessary weapons, the necessary battles, we'll fight them, that will put us on top of the mountain. Everybody should say amen now. Yeah. Fasting. What is fasting? Fasting is a deliberate decision, listen, a deliberate decision to abstain from food for a particular time. From food. All these ones that I hear, some people say, I'm fasting TV. There's nothing like fasting TV. <laughs> fasting is a deliberate decision to do what? Abstain from food for a given period of time. That's what fasting is. Oh, I, I'm fasting... Um, I'm fasting, I'm, I'm fasting a fried chicken. That's nonsense. It's not biblical. You know? So fasting is a weapon. It's a weapon. It's a strong weapon. Now, the last one I want to talk about before we close out is the anointing oil. The anointing oil. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. Quickly. Isaiah 10, 27. It shall come to pass in that day. Let's see it in the New King James translation. Okay, that's good. It shall come to pass in that day that the burden will be what? Taken away from your shoulders and the yoke, for the yoke will be destroyed by what? Because of the anointing oil. It's the anointing oil that destroys the yoke, that lifts up the burden. I don't have time. You know, I, I think I've misused my time. I wanted to show you biblical passages. When God brings the anointing on you, but I think I'll give you this illustration. When God brings the anointing on you, which is what we're going to do this morning, we're going to anoint everybody. The anointing. The anointing all. The anointing comes on you. The anointing is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. It's a type of the Holy Spirit, the anointing all. The anointing operates in two dimensions or two pathways. Two pathways. This is anointing, right? Anointing. Two pathways. One pathway, and I want you to understand this because this is where some Christians make a mistake. One pathway, let's call it, we don't have time to analyze that, let's call it the fast pathway. Fast. The other pathway, I don't know if I should call it the slow pathway, but what's the opposite of fast? Okay, you said so. Slow. It's not really slow. It's not really slow. Huh? Well, it may be transient, but it's not. But I want you to understand. It is slow in the sense that it does not move as fast as the fast pathway. Does that make sense? It's slow in the sense that it doesn't move as fast as the fast pathway. And when you look at scriptures, you will see this. And I'll give you a good example. When Saul was anointed... 1 Samuel chapter 
9, 1 Samuel chapter 9 or 1 Samuel chapter 10. Let's go there quickly. Oh boy, I've run out of time. 1 Samuel chapter 10. When Saul was anointed, verse 10, chapter 10, verse 1, then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said to him, is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? Look at what he told him. He said, when you live here, when you live here, you will see two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzah, and they will say to you, the donkeys which you have been looking for have been found. The anointing of God upon your life can work in such a way that that thing you have been looking for, God will expedite the process and give it to you quickly. Amen. Oh, come on, let me hear a good amen. amen. The declaration of your word, of your mouth, is an evidence of your faith. The anointing of God can expedite your search and bring you to a, a conclusion, a terminal conclusion. Now, he goes on to say, verse 3, he says, then you shall go forward. The anointing will make you go. Oh, say it aloud. The anointing will make you go. You will go forward. You will go forward. In this house, you will go forward. Then he says you will see three men. I'm not expensating on everything there. It's a much bigger um, story. He said you will see three men going up to God at Bethel. These three men will meet you carrying three young goats. Another will be carrying three loaves of bread. And another will be carrying a skin of wine. Three men carrying what? A skin of wine and three loaves of bread. Say that with me. Three. Three. And skin of wine. Okay. And what will happen? They will greet you. And they will give you what? How many men were they? So if they are carrying three loaves of bread, that means a loaf for every person, isn't it? Oh, come on, talk to me, church. But they will give you how many? Oh, come on, come on. Do you get that? They will give you not one, but they will give you two. God will give you a double anointing. God will give you a double provision. You know, on, I think it was on Friday, Pastor Peter was leading prayers. He said, Elisha asked for double the anointing on Elijah. And he said, don't ask God for something small. He said, ask God for something big. Ask God for something big. Today, I release an anointing upon you that will give you more than you can get in the name of Jesus. The first, the first round. They will give you three. They will give you two. And you see, that also speaks of favor. Why would they give you two when there are three and you are getting two? These are strangers. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Strangers will respond to you. And it goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. You see, and then you become a different man. The anointing it will expedite the process for you. Pam, 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 pam. Look at somebody and say, pam, 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 pam. That's the fast route. The slow route, seemingly slow route. Put that in quotation marks, open and close. The slow route, route is the one that happened to David or the one that happened to Joseph. Joseph saw the dreams, saw the visions. But where did he end up? He started up in slavery. Right? Was sold to slavery. And then from slavery, he went for that down. Where? Was he anointed? Was he anointed? Genesis chapter 39 verse 3. He said, and the Lord was with Joseph and blessed him. And he was a prosperous man. And he was a blessing in everywhere he went to. Was he anointed? Yes. Seemingly slow path. From the dungeon, what happens? Down. 
Now, why I say that is so that you get out of this place and you do not think that the battles you are going to be encountering, because listen, the battles do not stop. As you move higher, what happens? Higher devils. You move higher, and you move higher, don't think that God is demoting you. Because God does not demote his children. Say that with me. He doesn't. The pathway of the righteous will shine brighter and brighter and brighter into a perfect day. Him whom God has called, he justifies. And whom God has justified, he will glorify. You will be glorified. So, that is it. So, that is why we bring the anointing on you. That's why we're anointing you today. So that you understand that God will walk on these two routes. For some of you, bam, 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 bam. As you walk out of this door, some of you have testimonies already. Bam, 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 bam. Oh, come on, say it. Bam, 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 bam. Favor! 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 You know, one of the passages we want to pray this morning, Ruth, Ruth came into, Ruth followed her mother-in-law to, uh, to Bethlehem. And uh, the mother-in-law says, shall I not Give me Ruth chapter 3 verse 1. Say, shall I, shall I not look for rest for you? Shall I not, shall I not give you security? Shall I, shall I not try and give you stability? If you know the story, Ruth goes out and she enters a farmland and starts harvesting. Harvesting. And Boaz came, comes around and says, who is that? Who is that lady? That's why girls, if you are single, always dress well. Always, always dress you because you never know where you will meet that guy. Don't wait. And let me tell you, guys are spiritual, but they look at, look at, they, look at the way you dress. they look at the way you dress. And Boaz said, and she, she had no clue that this conversation was taking place. Boaz said, hey, to, told her servant, his servant, he said, you know what? I want you to drop portions of the wheat and the barley. Drop, drop it around the farmland so that as she comes picking, She'll be finding more than she expected. She can't speak it. She had no clue that this conversation was going on. My brethren, I decree over your life today. May favor surround you in accordance with the word of God. Find favor. Find favor. I preached a message many years ago. I said, the king is on my side. I, I remember that message. That, was, that message. I preached that message out of fear because the man who was supposed to preach did not show up. <laughs> so they, when Los Angeles, when they called me, Pastor Gandhi said, hey, Reverend George is not coming. I said, what do you mean by he's not coming? I almost passed out. I came and locked myself up in the then, the, then church office. Came and preached that message. That was one message. After I preached, somebody gave me a check of $200. It has never happened before. I said, this message was too much for me. The king is on my side. And I was talking about Daniel. They threw Daniel in the lion's den, but the king could not sleep. The king could not sleep. Little did he know at the time, and the people who were plotting against him, that the chief executive officer was fighting for that illegal immigrant who was in the lion's den. Stand up on your feet, my friend. Oh, glory to God. The king is on your side. The king is on your side. The king is on your side. The king is on your side! You're going to pray. Father, as you are on my side, fight my battles for me. Fight my battles for me. Fight my battles for me. You have said that the battle is the Lord's. The king is.
is on your side. The king is on your side. The king is on your side. Open your mouth and pray. If you cannot stand up, sit down or kneel down or lie down. But ask God, Father, fight my battle for me. Fight my battles. Fight my battles. Oh God Almighty, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, fight my battles for me. Fight my battles. Fight my battles. Father, fight my battles. Oh God, fight my battles for me. Fight my battles for me. They say to me, where is your God? Then my God is in the heaven above and he rules in the affairs of men. Fight my battles for me, oh God. Fight my battles. Fight my battles. Father, fight my battles for me. I bring my case to the supreme court of heaven. Fight my battles for me. Mighty God, I ask you today, fight my battles for me. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, fight my battles for me. Fight my battles. Fight my battles, oh God. Fight my battles, fight my battles. Father, fight my battles. Mighty God, I pray in the name of Jesus. Oh God, marshal the agents of heaven. Marshal the angels. Fight my battles for me. I ask you today, our Lord and our God, fight my battles for me. Heavenly Father, fight my battles for me. I pray, oh God, I pray, Heavenly Father, fight my battles. Mighty God, I ask you, I need your help, I need your help. I need your help, oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Ruth 3, he says, shall I not ask for stability for you? Shall I not ask for security for you? Shall I not ask for protection for you? But then we're going to pray that this immigration issue that some people have decided that we will not, we will not, the reform will never take place. We are going to pray that they will be uprooted in the name of Jesus. Yeah. And listen to me. I think 19, uh, 2007, when that debate was going on, 2006, the, the debate started. 2007, the debate was going on and on and on and on and on and on. And there were some people in Congress. I remember one man who said that that, that reform will only take place on his dead body. Ah. We're praying. We say he wants to die. Let him die. And I remember Sensen Brenner was in Congress at that time. Sensen Brenner is not in Congress today. James Hassard was the speaker of the house who ensured that that thing did not pass the house. When James Assad left office, he went to jail. Speaker of the house. Went to jail. Go and check it out why he went to jail. Another of those people who was in the Senate at the time, Jeff Session. Jeff Session spoke. That's how I knew his name. Speaking, verbose, southern, anti-immigrant accent. Why must you let them come in? They must go to the back of the line. They, they are talking nonsense. They are talking nonsense. I have been a victim of the immigration crisis. Part of the reason why the immigration issue has not been resolved is because the immigration department makes a lot of mistakes. My file was misplaced. My file was misplaced. My file was not on their desk. Eventually, when somebody found my file, many months later, they asked me to send documents. I sent documents. Guess what? All the documents were misplaced. So when later on I called again, they wrote me and said, we asked you for documents and you did not send the document. But thank God, when they received the documents, I printed out on their page that the documents had been received. So I sent it to them. Up until today, we don't know whether they found the document or didn't find the document. This country is a country of immigrants. When the president goes around saying, oh, this immigrant killed this one, this immigrant killed that one, 
in the last two weeks, I'm surprised that nobody has said that the custom patrol officer, supervisor, who has killed more than five people, is an American citizen. The one who killed his two children, his father and his mother, is not an immigrant. Crime and sin is not an immigrant problem. It's a human problem. So when people make up their mind and say immigrants will not enter, who is the governor over all the earth? Who is the one who rules in the affairs of men? Are you with me in this church today? We are going to pray. It's a two-point prayer. It's a two-dimensional prayer. Number one, that the immigration reform will take place in our lifetime. Let me, are there some fighters in this house this morning? The immigration reform will take place in the name of Jesus. Number two, we are going to declare any man, any woman in any position of authority who has resolved that that will not be possible, they will be removed. They, they, will, be, they will be uprooted. Look at Jeff Session now. He's become a mockery, even though in government. He's become a mockery. And eventually he's going to be removed. He says it will not happen. He will be hold. It will happen. Because there are children of God who need to be integrated. Oh, come on. Open your mouth and pray. 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 We declare today in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It will happen. 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 It will happen in the name of Jesus. It will happen in the name of Jesus. It will happen, we declare and we decree. In the name of the resurrected Christ, there will be a reform in this country that will allow the integration of everyone who deserves to be integrated. There will be a reform. We declare today in the name of Jesus, any man, any woman who will not allow that to happen, we command that they will be uprooted. We command that they will be uprooted. We command that they will be displaced. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we declare today, by the power of the Almighty God, we release the fire of God. We release the judgment of God upon them in the name of Jesus. We speak against them. We speak against them. Mighty men of war, fight on the behalf of your children. Fight on the behalf of your people. Fight on the behalf of your children, O oh God. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Father, we ask you, fight, 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 fight. God Almighty, silence the mouth of men and women who will not let it happen. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me help you understand that. God told the children of Israel, he said, listen. He said, when you go to your land, he said, be hospitable to the stranger. He said, because you were a stranger at one time. He said, be careful. He told, some people were bringing children to Jesus, and the apostles said, hey, don't let them. Jesus said, come on. Suffer so little children to come unto me. He said, because there are angels are always watching me. They are in the presence of God in heaven. Brethren, look at this country. 1,500 children are lost. You, you have no clue what it is for a child to wake up around strangers, cannot find their parents. For parents to go back home, leaving their children behind, and they don't know where their children are. For some of the people who step forward to help to preserve those children, are now being arrested and deported. Brother, let's look at scriptures. Do you know that um, uh, Miriam was the one that went to take care of Moses? Come on, are you with me? And, and some, some foolish, foolish immigrants, I hope this thing is, foolish immigrants who benefited from the same benevolence and grace to come into this country are sitting down in arrogance and saying that, ah, uh, they, they have entitlement to come in here. Who made you the governor over all the earth? When the earth is the loss and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. 
How dare you put yourself in a position where you say you've gone through that door of mercy and benevolence and now you shut the door and you don't want others to come in. Grab somebody's hand. Grab somebody's hand. We are going to pray that the angels of God who, who were the angels of these children who are before God's, God's presence that they will bring judgment on everyone who is fighting against them. Go ahead and pray. Oh God Almighty, we ask you today, do it, do it, do it, a quick work, a quick work in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, do a quick work, a quick work, a quick work, a quick work. Heavenly Father, we ask you today, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, do a quick work, oh God. Do a quick work, fight for these children, fight for these children, fight for these children, fight for these children, fight for these children. Fight for these children. Father, we pray today that they will be reunited with their families in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray today that they will be reunited with their families in the name of Jesus. Oh, God Almighty, we ask you. Mabra ligi digi ikoto zozando mbra leke ekata yale endegeni ya jansteke mebra likata ya vana ambra santa mabra degebo volo oto kono mo zozando eh jeke kali gidi digi ikapra ye masteke vo zozando heavenly father we ask you that lord you will do this and much more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we declare today. You brought us to this place. Every man you brought to this place for a purpose. Some came early. Some came later. And some are just coming now. You are a God of mercy. You are a God of great grace. You are the governor over all the earth. Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus. Make it easy. Make it possible. Expedite the process for your people in this land to find security, to find stability, to find integration in the name of Jesus Christ. Our Father, we pray for those people who, whose hearts have been hardened and callous and who have become so indifferent to the plight of the stranger, forgetting that at one time they too were strangers. We ask you, Lord, that you have mercy on them. Amen. Father, we ask you today that if they will not change, if not, they will not amend their ways, if they will not be careful about the indigent, about the stranger, about the helpless, about the voiceless, Father, we ask you, uproot them from their positions. For those of them in government, in Congress, in Senate, in the executive branch, at any level, in different states, who say this will never happen, an immigration reform, Father, we declare, if they say it will not happen, or if they say it will only happen on their dead bodies, let them indeed die in the name of Jesus Christ. So that that which needs to be done will be done. We are asking you, oh God, that you will touch the hearts of even the most hardened anti-immigrant individuals in government so that they will change their positions. But if they will not change their positions, may they be removed from positions in the name of Jesus Christ so that the people who will be favorably disposed to the plight of the immigrants, the plight of the stranger, the plight of the downtrodden, the plight of our helpless children, Father, they will be in positions in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you today and we bless you because we know you will do this and much more. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray.